But the bad thing about all religions is that, instead of being able to confess their allegorical nature, they have to conceal it. Accordingly, they parade their doctrine in all seriousness as true sensu proprio, and as absurdities form an essential part of these doctrines, you have the great mischief of a continual fraud. You may not realize it, but hidden in his collection of essays, Arthur Schopenhauer has worked out a more or less systematic philosophy of religion. This is the first part in a series of videos that will cover Schopenhauer's unique outlook on religion. If you want to be notified when the other parts come out, please consider subscribing and clicking the bell button. Schopenhauer's main gripe with religion is with the distinction they make between meaning in sensu proprio versus meaning in sensu allegorico. Sensu proprio is the Latin term he uses, which basically means in a literal sense. Sensu allegorico, of course, means in an allegorical sense. What happens with religion is that they present some kind of dogma, which might be true in an allegorical sense, but they have to pretend to mean it in a literal sense. Religion cannot pretend its main tenets are merely allegorical, because doing so would mean to undermine their own credibility. Let's look at an example. The wretched state of the world is a given starting point in Schopenhauer's philosophy. However, Christianity has to somehow reconcile that fact with the doctrine that God, a good and all-powerful being, created this horrible world. To explain the contradiction of a morally good being creating an imperfect world full of suffering, Christianity presents the fall of man with the story of Adam and Eve. The world was a paradise, but Adam and Eve ate the apple, they were punished by God, and ever since the world has lost its perfection. Adam and Eve is a story of fiction, or rather, a story of mythology. More precisely, it's an etiological myth, meaning that it's a myth with the express purpose of explaining some sort of state in the affairs of the world. In this case, the myth tells us why the world is as horrible as it is. But here's the catch. The story of Adam and Eve is true, but not true in a literal sense. The story works as an allegory, not as a factual history. Yet, for most of church history, the story was treated as literally true, except maybe by professional theologians. The public at large, in any case, was taught to believe the story of Adam and Eve as though it were a true history of the world. Why do religions have to pretend they are literally true? Schopenhauer's answer is elitist. The public is too stupid to believe anything else. The public is not intelligent enough. Their reason can only grasp concepts in sensu proprio, not in sensu allegorico. Religion is the metaphysics of the masses. By all means let them keep it. Let it therefore command external respect, for to discredit it is to take it away. Just as they have popular poetry, and the popular wisdom of proverbs, so they must have popular metaphysics too, for mankind absolutely needs an interpretation of life. And this, again, must be suited to popular comprehension. Philosophy, or metaphysics, is the vehicle to literal truth. But, as Plato has said, the multitude can't be philosophers. We shouldn't forget that. Therefore, religion serves the need of offering the public consolation, reassurance, hope, and, most importantly, a system of ethics and popular metaphysics through which to interpret the world around them. Founders of religion and philosophers come into the world to rouse him from his stupor and point to the lofty meaning of existence. Philosophers for the few, the emancipated, the founders of religion for the many, for humanity at large. Schopenhauer's view on religion can be summarized as follows. Religion is truth wearing the garment of falsehood. Moreover, some religions are more truthful than others. Schopenhauer has worked out an original and unique system to determine which religions are the most truthful to philosophy. Of course, when we say philosophy, we really mean Schopenhauer's philosophy, because he was convinced he had found the eternal truth of the universe himself, 
But Schopenhauer introduces interesting distinctions we can make in the analysis of the major religions of the world in order to arrive at some kind of order or hierarchy of truthfulness. In this part we will zoom in on Schopenhauer's criticism and evaluation of Christianity and the theological problem of reconciling the Old with the New Testament. In a nutshell, we saw that for Schopenhauer each major world religion has a kernel of truth. The function of religion in a society is to preserve a metaphysics of the people. Religions communicate metaphysical truth in such a way as to become intelligible to the populace. However, this means that some religions are better than others, in the sense that some religions are better at communicating fundamental truths than others. These fundamental truths, of course, are synonymous with Schopenhauer's philosophy, according to Schopenhauer. When Schopenhauer evaluates a religion, he will therefore look at the similarities between that religion and his own philosophy. The more similarities, the more virtuous the religion. Of course, this presupposes knowledge about Schopenhauer's philosophy. There's a link in the description to our video on his magnum opus, The World as Will and Representation. With all of this said, let's take a look at Schopenhauer's unique view on comparing religions. I cannot place, as is always done, the fundamental difference of all religions in the question whether they are monotheistic, polytheistic, pantheistic, or atheistic, but only in the question whether they are optimistic or pessimistic. The fundamental characteristic of a religion for Schopenhauer is whether its worldview is optimistic or pessimistic, but we need to clarify what he means by this. Optimistic or pessimistic, that is, whether they present the existence of the world as justified by itself, and therefore praise and value it, or regard it as something that can only be conceived as the consequence of our guilt and therefore properly ought not to be because they recognize that pain and death cannot lie in the eternal, original and immutable order of things. Is the material world viewed as good or bad? This is the most important question you can ask about a religion. Buddhism, for example, has a pessimistic outlook according to Schopenhauer, as does Hinduism. Why? Because the material world is described as illusory and full of suffering. The next part in this series will explore Buddhism further, but for now, let's go back to Christianity. Christianity is complicated. The main religious text in Christianity, the Bible, is composed of the Old and the New Testament. The problem is that Schopenhauer sees an optimistic worldview in the Old and a pessimistic worldview in the New Testament. Let's take a look at his arguments. One of the most well-known phrases of the Old Testament is and he saw that it was good. In the story of creation in Genesis, God himself explicitly states that his creation, the material world, is fundamentally good. This optimism is the greatest flaw in Judaism, says Schopenhauer, and they needed a story like the fall of man to account for this error. The fall introduces the element of pessimism, a doctrine demanded by the most obvious facts of the world. There is no truer idea in Judaism than this. By contrast, Schopenhauer assigns a pessimistic view of the material world to the New Testament. In contemporary theology, this aspect of the New Testament has often been forgotten. But Schopenhauer cites verses such as John 12, 31 to argue his case. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. The prince of this world, who is mentioned by Jesus, is Satan or the devil. So we have here the equivocation of Satan with the material world. In other words, the material world is evil. This is a repeated theme throughout the New Testament. Let's look at one of Paul's letters. In his letter to the Romans, we find the following proclamations regarding the material world. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. In verse 21 we also read that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. In summary, the Christian worldview is deeply pessimistic regarding the material world. 
the larger message of the Gospels and of the New Testament as a whole is that there will come a time when something better than the material world comes. Something that will liberate us from the decay of the material world. No such proclamations exist in Judaism or the Old Testament. Schopenhauer's main conclusion regarding Christianity is that the New Testament fixed the fundamental error of the Old Testament in insisting on a pessimistic outlook. We see, then, that the doctrines of the Old Testament are rectified and their meaning changed by those of the New, so that, in the most important and essential matters, an agreement is brought about between them. Another major difference is about ethics. In the Old Testament, ethics are centered around the Ten Commandments and various proclamations of God. The central word in Old Testament ethics is law. By contrast, the New Testament has Jesus tell us that he is the fulfillment of the law and that his primary message is about loving one's neighbor. If the central word of Old Testament ethics is law, then the central word in the New Testament is love. This latter view of ethics as love is closer to Schopenhauer's form of secular ethics in which compassion is the greatest ethical good. An ethics based on duty or law has no room in Schopenhauer's ethics of compassion. But an ethics of love sure does. This is another reason why Schopenhauer rates the New Testament higher than the Old. Its conception of ethics is closer to his own. Conclusion Schopenhauer's take on Christianity is interesting and fairly unique in the history of philosophy and theology. The primary distinction between optimistic and pessimistic is an original contribution to a theological debate that has been centuries old and still rages on today. His view of Christianity as fundamentally pessimistic is also a relic of another time. In today's theological discourse, the pessimistic character of Christianity has largely been forgotten or neglected. Some of the most important passages in the New Testament, according to Schopenhauer, such as those we cited in this video, are barely known among Christians today. So you could say Schopenhauer's primary value to the theological debate is a renewed appreciation for the pessimistic outlook of Christianity, as strange and paradoxical as that may sound. The Christian ethics of love, as contrasted by the Old Testament ethics of law, are also an important distinction, and it echoes Schopenhauer's compassion-based ethics in opposition to Kant's ethics based on law and duty. But this is not the final word on religion. We have two more religions to go through, the two Schopenhauer rated highest, both from a metaphysical as well as from an ethical standpoint. We are talking of course about Brahmanism and Buddhism. We will tackle these in the next video in this series. The Vedas, the fruit of the highest human knowledge and wisdom, the kernel of which has at last reached us in the Upanishads, is the greatest gift of this century. Welcome to part 3 in our series on Schopenhauer's philosophy of religion. In part 1 we discussed Schopenhauer's view on religion in general. In part 2 we discussed his critique of Christianity in particular. If you haven't watched those videos yet, we highly recommend you do so. Link in the description. Let's quickly look at Schopenhauer's means of evaluating a religion again. Religions, being calculated with reference to the power of comprehension, of the great mass of men, can only have indirect, not immediate, truth. The value of a religion will accordingly depend upon whether the greater or less content of truth which it contains under the veil of allegory, and then upon the greater or less distinctness with which it becomes visible through this veil, thus upon the transparency of the latter. In the previous part, we saw how Christianity doesn't score too well on this front. Schopenhauer found in the Old Testament a worldview that was so much at odds with his own philosophy that it could not possibly be truthful. Thankfully, according to him, the New Testament set straight the errors of the Old. Still, one major group of religions remains. It's pretty well known that Schopenhauer greatly admired both Buddhism and Hinduism. It's said he read the Upanishads every night before bed, and at the end of his life he even taught himself Sanskrit. Let's take a closer look at his thoughts on these Eastern religions. One thing to keep in mind is that Schopenhauer is writing in the 19th century. 
During this time, Sanskrit literature was just being translated into Latin and other major European languages. Knowledge of these religions in the West was incomplete at this point in time. Most of what Schopenhauer knew, before he learned Sanskrit himself, was based on what other European explorers reported and translated. In other words, second-hand knowledge, which might not have been entirely correct by today's standards. For that reason, this video will not be a deep dive into the nuts and bolts of Buddhism and Hinduism. Instead, we'll tackle a few of the major aspects of these religions and see how they are in agreement with Schopenhauer's philosophy. First up is the general character of the religion. Recall how in the previous parts, we saw how Schopenhauer calls religions either pessimistic or optimistic, depending on how they interpret the nature of the material world. According to this classification, Judaism was optimistic, while Christianity was pessimistic. Buddhism and Hinduism, of course, are both pessimistic with regards to the material world. But what does this mean exactly? The true spirit and kernel of Brahmanism and Buddhism is the knowledge of the vanity of earthly happiness, the complete contempt for it, and the turning away from it to an existence of another, nay, an opposite kind. The Buddhistic acknowledgement that life is suffering, that earthly happiness cannot be found, the strict ascetic lifestyle of Buddhists and Brahmans, these factors are, in Schopenhauer's lexicon, signs of a pessimistic religion, a religion that regards with contempt the material world and seeks to turn away from it through fasting, meditation and abstinence. The question is, where does this pessimism come from? Ultimately, the pessimistic outlook must stem from an epistemic skepticism regarding the material world. What this means is that there must be a conviction that the material world is not the world of supreme importance, that something exists beyond mere matter, that the material world is an illusion. A leading doctrine of the Vedas and Puranas, the doctrine of Maya, which is said to be just this visible world in which we are, a summoned enchantment, an inconstant appearance without true being, like an optical illusion or a dream, a veil which surrounds a human consciousness, something of which it is equally false and true to say that it is and that it is not. The illusory character of the material world, of course, is the main metaphysical claim of Schopenhauer in his work The World as Will and Representation. It is the most important piece of his philosophy, for all the rest depends on it. That the world appears to us both as will and representation is the basis for his ethics of compassion and also the basis for his theory of aesthetics. Really, the so-called veil of Maya from the Hindu and Buddhist tradition is just another word for world of representation in Schopenhauer's lexicon. To find this great agreement between Eastern and Western philosophy without being directly influenced by it was considered by Schopenhauer to be his greatest achievement. In any case, it must be a satisfaction to me to see my teaching in such close agreement with a religion which the majority of men upon this earth hold as their own, for it numbers far more adherents than any other. This agreement, however, must be the more satisfactory to me, because in my philosophizing I have certainly not been under its influence. For up until 1818, when my work appeared, there were very few, exceedingly incomplete and scanty accounts of Buddhism to be found in Europe. Only since then has fuller information about this religion gradually reached us. Therefore, the pessimistic aspect of Buddhism is not the most important distinction to be made. Schopenhauer makes yet another distinction, that between realism and idealism. The fundamental characteristics of the Jewish religion are realism and optimism, views of the world which are closely allied. They form, in fact, the conditions for theism. For theism looks upon the material world as absolutely real and regards life as a pleasant gift bestowed upon us. On the other hand, the fundamental characteristics of the Brahman and Buddhist religions are idealism and pessimism, which look upon the existence of the world as in the nature of a dream and life as the result of our sins. To be sure, Schopenhauer also finds this idealism in Christianity, where it takes the form of the afterlife or the kingdom of God. But in Buddhism and Hinduism, he regarded this doctrine as more developed. 
that the material world is ultimately illusory and empty is much more prominent in Buddhism than it is in Christianity. And consequently, the Buddhist notion of nirvana posits non-existence as the ultimate good. According to the doctrines of Buddhism, the world came into being as the result of some inexplicable disturbance in the heavenly realm of nirvana, that blessed state obtained by expiation, which had endured so long a time, the change taking place by a kind of fatality. This explanation must be understood as having at bottom some moral bearing. Subsequently, by a series of moral errors, the world became gradually worse and worse, true of the physical orders as well, until it assumed the dismal aspect it wears today. Excellent. We thus see how Buddhism and Brahmanism are in fundamental agreement, even if there are some particular differences, with Schopenhauer's metaphysical as well as his moral teachings. While New Testament Christianity is certainly in agreement with Schopenhauer's moral teachings, it is lacking on the metaphysical front. Buddhism and Hinduism, on the other hand, score well on both fronts. For this reason, Schopenhauer ranks the Eastern religions as the most perfect expressions of truth to be found in religion. The only place where you can find truth beyond religion? Well, that would be Schopenhauer's own philosophy, of course. We should never forget that Schopenhauer always takes himself as a reference point. He truly believed he had cracked the code, found the ultimate answers to life and existence. Whenever he critiques a system of thought, a philosophy or a religion, he takes his own system as a starting point. The more agreement, the more true it is. Still, even if you do not subscribe to Schopenhauer's system, his critiques highlight intriguing points of view and bring to attention often forgotten aspects of the religions he is critiquing. In this way, reading Schopenhauer is fruitful and worthwhile even if you do not yourself subscribe to its main tenets. If you liked this series on Schopenhauer's philosophy of religion, please like and subscribe, as it helps out the channel a great deal. If you are interested in exploring Schopenhauer's philosophy further, we have a long exposition video on his main work The World as Will and Representation here at the channel, as well as a video on Schopenhauer's pessimism. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.